this video the other day just to remind myself <clears throat> where we were before the break, and then I couldn't really hear it very well. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Volume up. If you can't hear, you have to turn your volume up or um, tell me I'm wasting your time by posting these. So we are in Acts chapter 9, and let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your servant Paul through the, the message of the gospel that he proclaimed and, and that we still proclaim through, through your inspired word. Help us to understand and better your word as we meet together. Guide us by your Holy Spirit and give us joy in Jesus and in his victory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we were, we did, last, last week we ended at verse 19, after the conversion of Saul there, and I think we talked a little bit about the, you, the, how he tells, the Lord tells Ananias that he's going to, that not to be afraid, he's going to go and tell Saul that he's going to be the apostle, and then he says that he's going to show him how much he must suffer for the cause of of my name or for the sake of my name and that we talked a little bit last time about that that is one of the things that Jesus warned the disciples told the disciples that would be part of their ministry is that it would involve suffering it's only through many tribulations we enter the kingdom of heaven Acts 14 says and and uh, that that's what we also have been called to second Timothy 3 tells us that that all of us will suffer for the sake of, of Christ's name in this life. And that is kind of a fearsome thing in a way, but it, you know, it's, we'd, rather, we'd rather being a disciple meant ease and comfort and, and prosperity and all the things that go with that. But it isn't to be this side of heaven. But, you know, as they say, the plus side is there's a great retirement plan, you know. We we get to be with Jesus one day, and 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 He has us now, but will will bring us into His heavenly home. So there we we kind of went through, and and we talked a little bit about He immediately after Ananias comes, and and he's Saul's been hasn't eaten or drank for three days. Ananias comes and tells him God sent him, and he. His scales fall from Saul's eyes. He rises up. He's baptized and he's strengthened, and that's where. So that's where we were. Verse verse nineteen. For some days, Saul was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately. <clears throat> yeah, I got my little. And immediately, Saul proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of god now that would be would would seem to be about as as compelling an argument as you could ever make if somebody who has been doing nothing but try to destroy the gospel of christ is all of a sudden and and the people know why he's going and why he's there so so and all of a sudden he is preaching jesus and he is there can you see it up here Am I on the right part? <laughs> so, so there he is in Damascus, up here, and and all of a sudden he's he's standing up and going to to the synagogues. He's going to their to the church, the place where they would be most horrified to see him show up. He's going to those places and telling them that no, Jesus really is the Son of God. That I've seen him with my own eyes. Let me interrupt you for a second. Yes. Um, is this the only place in the Bible where Saul turns to Paul? Saul will in he's in the Gentile contexts of the, the ministry later on. He's gonna be Paul. Okay. And you know, he he was a, had dual citizenship, so it's so it's possible his name Paul was was his. I mean he's a Jew. Name? He wasn't a so it's it's possible that that was the name he that he was known by whenever he was out traveling in the Gentile areas, and Saul in in these Jewish areas. 
I could be like him, like Paul. Well, how so? You want another name? No, <laughs> no. I don't want. I want this, this, this to be more, you know, uh, vocal. You know, yeah. know my my strengths and my weaknesses when I can talk, and and I talk whenever I feel like. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, if it makes you feel better. I don't notice that about you, but <laughs> <laughs> you seem to say pretty smart things to me. So, um, well, thank you. But he's but he's brilliant. I mean, if you were gonna if you were gonna make a list of of the people that you would say this is one that's gonna be gonna be a great apostle, he's gonna take the gospel. It wouldn't be the fisherman, probably, or it wouldn't be maybe the the tax collector like Matthew. It'd probably be Saul, except for the fact that he was viciously trying to destroy the church, you know, take that part away. But he's brilliant and he's articulate and 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 is going to go around and, and really do what Stephen was doing when Stephen made the argument and they, they had to fall silent before him because they had no way of overcoming the wisdom with which he spoke. And how do what do you say to the guy? He's. They know what, why he's there, and he's saying, "I was wrong. Jesus is the Son of God. I saw him with my own eyes." The Jews are gonna, and this is the the. It's not ironic. It's kind of sad, but the reason he won't be able to carry out his ministry in the synagogue and in Jewish, it, primarily among the Jews, is because they are gonna hate him as the worst traitor mm -hmm. of all. So it's one of those sad things that that he can't go to his own people after that because their bitterness and their hatred for him is not going to let him find an audience there. But he's going to become the apostle to the Gentiles. So this is this is Saul and and boy, it's just, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and says said. Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? So they know it. There's something different here, something strange going on here. Uh, the word made havoc is, uh, is portheo, is used three times in the Bible. All three times it's used uh, with respect to Paul. Um, once here and twice in Galatians 1, where, where he was... Just trying to, it just means he was trying to destroy the, ch the church. Um, of those who call upon this name. It's those who are, are believers. And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Okay, so Damascus is a little bit off the beaten beaten path, I guess you'd say. It's it's quite a ways away from, from Jerusalem. And, you know, this is the apostles. While everybody else is, during the, that initial burst of persecution, everybody else fled from Jerusalem. The apostles kind of stayed, they stayed there in, in Jerusalem. So he's going to begin his preaching ministry quite a ways away from that, that center of the Jewish, the life of the Jewish synagogue, the temple. Um, what do we say? If Just a few things about Saul. Look at Acts chapter 22. Because in Acts 22, he's going to explain a little bit more about himself whenever he is. 22, uh, chapter 22, um, in verse 3. Now, Paul's been arrested here in, in Acts, chapter 20, Acts chapter 21. He's, he's arrested, and the Jews are trying to tear him apart. And, and uh, the centurions, the temple guards there, come down. They, they rescue Saul, and he's... Given his speech, now he's going to speak in Hebrew to the people there in Jerusalem and explain himself, kind of a last-ditch effort, of course, to, to share the gospel. 
He said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Let me see. Tarsus. I need a bookmark. There you go. Thank you. I'm so glad Martin's not sitting in this chair today. <laughs> <laughs> I hope he watches. Uh, so Tarsus is up here. So this is where, where Saul was from. So that's where he's, he says, I was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. The presumption is that, that he showed a lot of gifts and that he, I mean, if you were going to send your, your child away for expert training, you'd send them to whatever university. Well, if you wanted to send your, your child for religious training, it was going to be in Jerusalem. And if it was in, you know, if you were looking for the best of the best, it was going to be educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers. Now, if you remember Gamaliel um, earlier in the book of Acts, whenever, is it Acts 4? When, when, they're, when Peter and John are on trial and they're trying to decide what to do with him, uh, what to do with, with the disciples and what to do with Peter and John, might be Acts chapter five, but no, it's four. Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. Uh -huh. Is the so so Gamaliel gives gives because there's two trials there with with Peter and John, and Gamaliel gives them in one of these. He stands up and says his part and counsels them not to not to put them to death or not to to be harsh with them, but that if, because if the message they're preaching is from God, they're going to find themselves fighting against God, and mm -hmm. and that there's nothing they could do to up, to overthrow it if it's in fact is God who's the one that has given that, given them the message that they're speaking. So, um, yeah, it's in Acts chapter 5, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. I mean, you can put a, you can kind of put a, it, chapter 5, verse 34, they're on, on trial there, the apostles. A Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, yeah. held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put, the, to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, the oidas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew, drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found to, to be opposing God. So they took his advice. They called in the disciples, beat them, charged them not, not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. All right, I'm only going back to that just for a couple reasons. First, it's, it'll give us a little insight into to Saul's training here in, in Acts 22. He's, he's brought up in Jerusalem, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a very, very respected... I mean, it would be like if you got to go to Harvard University, which uh, I know that's no great shakes in my opinion, but if you were looking for the best of the best academic institutions, they would say, well, that's it. Well, Paul received the best training you could get according to the strict manner of the law of <clears throat> of our fathers. I would, would say this, Paul's personality seems to be very different than Gamaliel's. Gamaliel is counseling moderation. Gamaliel's saying, if you you don't want to fight, there's no sense fighting them with, with arms because you'll find yourself, you may find yourself fighting against God. Saul's attitude was exactly the opposite, is he was 
there was no moderation in him. He was a go-getter. Mm-hmm. And if, if you're to the point where you're willing to take take letters of, of whatever, to, to go to Damascus and arrest Christians and bring them back to stand before the Sanhedrin, you're pretty, I mean, you're the real thing. You're, you're really down with the, the battle against, against the Christian faith. So in this respect, even though he has, Saul has this great education, is this, with the brilliant mind of Gamaliel, and he's so respected. And some of that respect is going to go, go to Saul also because he's one of his disciples, but he's not a lot like him, just in the, in the actions he takes. Another thing about Saul, if you look at Galatians 1, in Galatians 1, he also, and I'm just trying to give us a little bit of a, a little bit of his autobiography or what he says about himself in the Gospels. And um, Galatians 1, I think I, I think it's, let's start at verse 11. It says, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was by preach was preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the tradition of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his Son to me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. Now, Paul's point in Galatians 1 is is Galatians is a almost a, a congregation in almost in rebellion in a way. They're, they're all trying to pick who's their disciple and who, who they are followers of, of whom. And so Paul is, at the beginning of Galatians, is in a sense trying to establish his authority for being able to speak to them as an apostle of Christ. But I just want you to see there again, he, he's, this was his own evaluation, admittedly, but it's, it's God's word too. He was persecuted the church violently. He was advancing in Judaism beyond many of, of his own age uh, among his people. So this isn't, you know, if, and I'm not saying this to diminish the, the, the fishermen and the, the tradesmen and, and the tax collectors that were part of Jesus' 12 disciples. But Saul is kind of on, at least if you looked at it from the outside, is on a different side of that. He is, he would have been among his peers standing as, as tall as you could stand. Philippians 3, he does the same thing, although in Philippians 3, it's kind of a charming, thank you for this. In Philippians 3, he is going to talk a little bit more about his background also, but here in Philippians 3, he's going to put it to a different end. He says, look out for for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we who we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence on the flesh. When he's talking about the mutilators, he's talking about the people who are insisting that to become a Christian, you have to enter through the door of Judaism. That you can't come that you can't come to Christ in faith, but you come to him through becoming a Jew first. And that involved circumcision, and that involved all of the, um, the 
purity laws and all of the dietary laws and all of those things. And that's what he's arguing against here. He says, put no confidence in the flesh. And this is the part that, in verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So, again, just going to, to know where he's come from. This is admittedly his own evaluation, but it's, it's him speaking by the Holy Spirit that he was the cream of the crop. He's, it's, it's risen to the top of his peers. And that makes what he says in the next verse all the more beautiful. But whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of, Jesus, of, of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And that whole section is a wonderful section. It just is it's so striking how it, you get a sense that his, his righteous standing before God and his, his goodness, that that was a very important thing to him formerly, that it was, that it was a matter of pride on, on Saul's part, that, that he was rising and, and becoming... Uh, you know, the leaders, but then after he comes to Christ in Philippians, I love that he says, all that stuff that before was so important to me, I count it as rubbish. It's, it's as, as just garbage to be thrown out that I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own. So that is the, you know, so that becomes the comfort that Saul now, now will know. He spent his life building his righteousness or his resume of, of how he's going to gonna serve God. He's been building that by means of the law in Philippians 3. It's, it's such a beautiful passage to show how much he came to understand that everything he thought he was was inadequate. But Christ is more than adequate, that Jesus is, is his righteousness and holiness and redemption. Yeah, the last part of that too is really great. Yeah. Not that anything isn't great. But yes, it is. That's all the um, all the way through verse fourteen is it's one of those beautiful passages that is a you know it, it, then he goes on to say not that I've ob obtained it already you know, that he's pushing forward and in faith and, and resting in that righteousness as he goes forward. So, okay, so that this, so this is Saul. He increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. All right, verse 20, verse 23. Whenever, whenever, it's, whenever it words it like that, you know, sometimes even at, during the Old Testament, sometimes Jesus Christ almost became a name or was used like a name. Whenever it, whenever it says that he was confounding the Jews and proving that Jesus was the Christ, he is literally talking about the office that Christ came to fulfill, that all of the Jews have spent all of their history being told the Messiah's coming, and you keep waiting, watching. It, it appears that their expectation of that Messiah was something like a general slash king. king. And, and that's what they were 
they were looking for all the human benefits they could get out of the Christ when he came. And, you know, Saul is now convincing them that Jesus is the Christ that they were looking for. So back there in, in Acts 9 again, 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. This is, it's the rest of the book. I mean, this poor guy, it, it, it really is, is amazing whenever, whenever the Lord said to Ananias that he's going to show Saul how much he must suffer for the sake of the gospel, how much he suffered for the sake of the gospel. I mean, it had to be a, I mean, and this is only the beginning. We'll continue to see it all through this book. The Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. There's another time at the end of Acts, you're going to see that again, the plot is foiled because some, somehow Saul finds out. The plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. I wish I had, I had a Sunday school picture of this. I <clears throat> should have brought it. It's kind of neat. You know, the, 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 a lot of times the houses were built into the walls in different portions. And, and if they're, they're keeping their eyes on that gate so they can see him. But oh, there it goes out the back window. And it's interesting, too, it says in verse 24 that his disciples took him by night. <clears throat> so we don't know at this point who those are. Later on, you're going to see you're going to see different parts of the book of Acts where it, it starts. It switches from and Saul did this and Saul did that to and we did this. We did that. So you know that Luke is traveling with him, and Luke is a disciple of, of Saul's and all that, those kinds of things. But we don't know who these disciples are, if they're just people who heard the message that the Holy Spirit spoke through Saul there in Damascus. They were convinced, and they were believers, and they loved him enough to, to get him out of there so he didn't get killed. That doesn't mean that they followed him. They could have stayed in the church. That's true. Yep, that would be, I mean, if they were, uh, presumably, if they were from there, they would have. Okay. And when he had come, come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Did they know about it? Well, you know, they've probably heard something about him, but I they still remember them as Saul trying to destroy us rather yeah. than yeah. But I mean, if they, if they probably saw him standing, being the coat man while they were stoning Stephen and all those kinds of things that they knew of those letters that he had to capture all the Christian Jews uh, who had run away. So. You, in my view, I think that it would be very, sometimes you think, oh, are they being sincere or is this just the, the most wicked plot of all? Yeah. Because cause now, yeah. if, if, we, if he behaves himself for a few weeks, then comes in and gets in the inner circle and destroys you know, the yeah. apostles, yeah. And that would be, you know, be the cruelest defeat of them all. So they don't believe him anyway. But Barnabas took Saul and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas we met in Acts chapter 4. Right? At, if you remember in Acts chapter 4, it was, it's talking, it's in verse 36, Acts chapter 4, 36. It's talking there in Acts chapter 4 about how the community of belief, excuse me, of believers there in Jerusalem was, 
almost a commune, the way we think of, of sharing everything. They shared all their things. In verse 36, it says, Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold the field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So that's the first time we meet Barnabas. He's a, a native of Cyprus. He's 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 on board. I mean, he is down with the the he believes in it. He sold his property and laid it at the apostles' feet to help s- sustain the church. And now we find in Acts nine, Barnabas is the one that links is able to somehow connect Saul back to the apostles so that he can be part of that, can be heard. and, and well, Apparently he must have actually heard it. Maybe he was there. Uh, so he doesn't, doesn't say that. I yeah. think it's probably more likely that he heard or had some relationship with the, yeah. with the people that were in Damascus, maybe that he trusted. Let's see. He is going to be, if Antioch is right here, whereas Damascus is down here, later on, you know, in Acts chapter 4, Barnabas is down in Jerusalem. He's selling his property and giving it to the disciples. Later on, Barnabas is going to become a big part of this church in Antioch. So it's possible that you know, they had, you know, that he heard some of the things that were going on there in Damascus. Um, I don't know. We don't we don't necessarily know how those two got connected, but they are going to become a mission team and they are going to make the first missionary journey and preach the gospel and really take it farther than it's ever been been proclaimed before. Barnabas took Saul, brought him to the prof, the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem. This is Saul. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists. A Hellenist would be, could be just a a Greek speaker, but it's probably Greek-speaking Jews. Grecian Jews. Yes. But what? What's Grecian? Just Greek-speaking yeah. So, and again, he, he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Tarsus and sent him, he, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. It's just like a PBS documentary, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So, should be filming this. That's right. Can we, can we get tight? <laughs> <laughs> so here's Jerusalem. Caesarea is down here on the coast. And then Tarsus is where he's from. Okay. And, and he gets sent off to Tarsus. And that is going to be an interesting time for, for Saul because he will certainly be sharing the gospel and preaching the name of Christ. The whole way. But he's also going to be getting back to his studies. Yeah. You know, to, you got to think that uh, that he's going to be poring over the scriptures and saying, "How did I miss this?" And 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 so he's going to sp- spend. Can you imagine him as a Jew now with his friends who are still Jewish and trying to convince them? You know. I mean, imagine the heartbreak for yeah. all the time for him. Yeah. Wow. You say that, and I, this is the epistle lesson from this coming Sunday. It's from Romans chapter 11. And uh, they cut this up, so this is terrible because it's not going to, I should just go get my bulletin because <laughs> I won't remember the verse. But in in. Oh, I 
don't know. I, well, I'll, I'll start in, in verse 13 because I can't remember and I should just go get the bulletin because I'm not smart enough to remember where, what verse it was in. But, you mean go get it? Um, I don't know if she'll have it printed yet. But he's talking in here about how he wishes for for that he, that he should even be cut off from Christ if it would somehow if it could save save the church of Christ and so people would you know that and to me that speaks to boy he did it he did ache for these people that that were just like he was they didn't know the gospel they didn't know what they were doing was wrong and they thought they were following following God's word and they were just pushing exactly the opposite of it um, maybe I'll come to it here it's now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now sh share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root but the root that supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the, the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Oh, it's in there somewhere. Um, it, it is in in those verses somewhere now if um, where he talks about his his desire and his longing for the salvation of the people of Israel and and it's very heartbreaking to imagine um, Read verses nine through eleven. You'll in Romans, we'll we'll, we'll you'll find it. So <laughs> you don't have to do to do that now. But the su the substance of what Paul is saying was say in there is essentially is exactly what you said. Boy, I wish I could even be be lost if it if it only it would mean the salvation of my people. Okay, let me. But see. like with Saul, it changed his whole life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which makes you think, are you willing to do that? <laughs> well, it changed all of the disciples' lives, really. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. They did without question. Grab hold and, and shook them down to, to there was nothing left and then rebuilt them and, and sends them out. Okay, so where did we? Verse 31. Ah, very good. Okay, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. So Saul's gone. He's in Tarsus, and he's he's going through his, his own new educational experience. The church in Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And, and in that, you hear that, that there is, it's been expanding. We've seen that ever since the ever since the persecution that ended up in Stephen's death, that the church, the people were fleeing from Jerusalem and taking the gospel with them into all of those various places. Yeah, am I giving the impression they sent them away so that the Christians there would become stronger without him? Was he, I mean, it sounds like that to me. <laughs> well, I think they sent him away for his health. Because they were going to kill him. Because the people were going to kill him. Okay, so they weren't Christians yet. They were just plain Jews. 
Okay, I thought the apostles sent them away. Yes, they did. The apostles oh. sent they the apostles helped him escape because the other people were going to kill him. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That is that's how I how I take that. Yeah. So and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Oh, you know the church grows in times of it's it's often said that the church the greatest periods of the church's growth have come in times of persecution, and that's probably true. Just looking at the, I mean the church has always to some extent been been facing those different issues, but it's it's. In the good times and bad times, during the time of persecution, they were spreading. The gospel was going forth. Now it's a time of relative peace for these next next years there in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And it's continuing to multiply. The Holy Spirit's building God's church. Now as Peter went here and there among all, he came down also to the saints Love that, love that word, you know, the holy ones, because it tells us a saint is not somebody who can pr prove three verifiable miracles or go through a canonization process, <laughs> but saints are actually believers in Christ. Because, Live or dead. Uh, yes, that's right. Because it's mm -hmm. in Christ and through faith in Christ that God declares us to be holy. So we're saints, we're holy ones. Now, Luther would, would always say we are at the same time sinner and saint, so we have both of these realities. But before God, in Christ, Paul will say, Christ Jesus has become our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. So where's my righteousness? It's Jesus. And, and my holiness, it's in him. That's where it's all at. And righteous lives, God wants lives lived in righteousness to follow. But what allows me to stand before God as a saint is, is to be covered in his, his precious blood and his innocent sufferings and death. So Peter came down to this also to the saints who lived in Lydda. And that is there. So that's pretty close to the saints who lived in Lydda. And there he found a, a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals, your, heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him. And they turn to the Lord. No faith in some others. <laughs> no matter all the miracles they saw. Yeah. Wow. I've often thought if I could do that, I would have a more successful ministry. But <laughs> <laughs> But then you're not human. I mean, nobody thinks of you as human because well, you're it's... now doing magic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then it's a magic trick. And yeah. So I'm just... But the presence of you, you know, the encouragement, the... I was kind of halfway teasing this. Wouldn't it be great to be able to go out and prove it by, oh, yeah. you know, making the bedridden person for eight years to stand up? And, you know, the thing about that, I always have to remind myself, it's in, in Luke 16, Jesus tells the parable of whether it's a parable or not, the rich man and Lazarus. And remember, the, the rich man is looking up from the bowels of hell saying, please send, send one of my brothers, to, or Lazarus, to dip his tongue in, or his finger in, in water and touch the tip of my tongue. To go send, send someone to speak to my brothers. And his word at the end of that is, if they don't listen to the prophets, they won't, to, to the law and the prophets, they won't hear and listen, even if somebody should rise from the dead. Right. And so it's it's always the word, God's word, finally that is that convicts and that that brings the hope of the gospel. And those are the things that the Holy Spirit uses to create faith. It's never like the miracles. I think served a mighty purpose in in the Book of Acts and in the early church. 
and I am not suggest. I think that God does miracles today, mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. I think that I think He does it. He heals people that shouldn't be healed. He He raises people that shouldn't be raised. And I think on a on a simpler level, He uses people to do a lot of that. He works through doctors and nurses and all those kinds of things. To, but you know, He can step outside of those channels and do because He's God can do it but those can't create faith those those miracles i think the function they serve in the book of acts is they attracted attention so now he can preach the gospel now now peter can tell him oh let me tell you about whose power this really is because it's not mine it's it's gospel it's jesus and he says that jesus christ heals you rise and make your bed well, let's finish Acts 9. I think we're, we're pretty close. Um, now, there was in Joppa, very near, okay, Lida's right there. Joppa's just up there on the coast. Now, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas, which translated for us means gazelle. Really? Gazelle, yeah. It's kind of a beautiful gazelle the image is graceful and sleek and and all those kinds of things but uh, yeah tabitha means dorcas i've heard of girls named tabitha i've never heard of a girl named dorcas i've had i've seen church societies called dorcas societies mm-hmm. you ever seen those yeah 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 and notably they tend to do knitting and, and needlework and all those kinds of things for helping people. So she was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an, in an upper room. And this is that, that would be their, their funeral rite. The body was a creation of God. It's God's body. This is the dear one that God's given them. They would they would prayerfully they would would wash that body and prepare it for burial, mm-hmm. and they'd bury it. So that's what the washing is that's going on here. They're not embalming her; they didn't they didn't do that, but uh, just washing her body and preparing it for that for that burial. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him urging him, please come to us without delay. So, you're always kind of left to wonder whether they are saying that before she actually dies or if it's if she's already died and they're just saying, well, Peter can do it. Let's call him and, and he, can, he can raise her from the dead. But they send the disciples there. They love this this Tabitha so much. They send two disciples to Peter to to hurry up and come down to Lydda to be with us. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows stood, all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. And there you see that's that's the origin of the Dorcas societies and the the ladies groups that take that name whenever they do quilting or things like that to provide for those who are in need. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. It's always just a chapter ago we met a Judas that wasn't the Judas we're used to and now Simon Peter is staying with Simon the Tanner so uh, the so 
So the Holy Spirit is building God's church and he's using this, these miraculous acts to, to cause people to give an open ear because it's the word that, that creates the faith. He stayed in Joppa for many days. I would say the interesting thing about that is that a tanner is somebody who does a lot of work with dead, dead bodies of animals and skins and that's probably the notable thing here in them telling us that Simon was a tanner is that for a Jew, for an Orthodox Jew, that would be an unclean act to be in, in contact with somebody who was whose job is, was always handling these dead bodies of animals. Mm -hmm. So right. you couldn't even be with them? No, no, no. 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 So it would it would and be I so, think it's the best place because they stink. That their tanneries, they stink. Oh, I'm sure they would. Because I saw a documentary on it, and it's um, like, oh my gosh, who wants to be there? <laughs> yep, pretty. I would think that would be pretty bad. But mm -hmm. so he's he's staying there, and and you know Leviticus, I think it's Le Leviticus 11 talks about you know, contact with the dead animals and the, making one unclean till the evening. So. Whatever else, in the next chapter, we're going to especially see that Peter's, Peter's Orthodox Judaism, in the next chapter, Peter still takes great pride that he follows the dietary laws of the Jewish people. But, you know, maybe already at this point in Acts chapter 9, the gospel of Christ is, is more important to him than, that, than those little... Those little rules. those little things that would be a would be a barrier or a hindrance from him coming into the home of this man and sharing the gospel, for the sake of the gospel he's doing it, and and God's going to continue to, God's going to tell him specifically in the next chapter, to kill and eat and and you know to make make to help him to understand that those ceremonial laws that bound him throughout his life in Judaism, that they were fulfilled in Christ and were no longer bound by those same ceremonial laws. And why do the Jews still adhere to all of that today? Are they, they're still looking for the Christ. They mm -hmm. don't believe that he has come really. Right? The, some of them, I don't know if... I, th I think that most Jews are functionally atheists. I know that's a weird weird thing to say, but that it is... Just to dis dis um, say what atheist means, and then that throws it away as true. It is, it is a, it's a heritage, and it's an ethnic identity. I'm a Jew because my parents were Jews, my parents, my grandparents were Jews. My, mm -hmm. Most of them, I mean... It, if you think of, of Hollywood and the, especially, you know, I know it's stereotype, but the dominant influence of Jews in Hollywood, those are not religious people. It's not, I mean, that's part of why you see Hollywood look like Hollywood looks, is they're not conflicted uh, with trying to follow the Torah and make good movies. They don't care about the Torah. They're ethnically Jews. So, that's not to say that there aren't Jews that are uh, like Orthodox Jews. Um, there's different yeah, different there's kinds different of Jews, mm -hmm. and and you know some of those are more or less. Uh, I would say some of those come more or less to the point of just being social clubs and ethnic identities, as opposed to a religious, like an Orthodox Jewish synagogue might be. So. Um, yeah, I so it's hard to if you if you read a little bit about Jews and, and their take on what their expectation is, they would say it was never that a savior would come and die. And you know, that's obvious in the New Testament. So they're so to the extent that they're looking for anything, they're looking for the land to be restored for God to put down all their enemies. Mm -hmm. And th those are the real nationalist kind of um, 
Jews that are really fighting for the restoration of Zion. Because um, they don't believe in the New Testament. Right. None of that exists for them. Right. So they're looking for, they're, it's all political. It's all political and it's all um, the restoration of that land and military and, and kings, king kind of a conquering leader kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so. Are there more uh, miracles in the Bible? I can't think of any that disciples did. Um, yes, they can, I mean, we'll see them. Okay. Yep. We'll see him, and we'll see Saul is going to get in on the, I don't want to say that, that sounds bad. He's going to get in on the the miracle game. God's going to do miracles through, through Saul and Barnabas here during his ministry too. Um, and that doesn't, if you look at like 1 Corinthians, there's every, appear, uh, you know, the understanding of that almost is if you look in 1 Corinthians, is that didn't even only remain with the disciples that in that first generation that the Holy Spirit was and this is my take on it without ever denying that the Holy Spirit still works miracles today is that God was dropping a great big rock in the water and sending out a wave you know and these miracles were a way to to go from 12 people 12 scared people sitting in a hut to, to take it out to the to every corner of the world. So and the reason only reason I'm saying that is because we kind of wouldn't we we love to see wouldn't we love to see Peter go into this the room and and bring us all in and be able to stand there and see it. And we don't see that very often. I'm not saying it's not possible. We can. God heals. God do, God does his miraculous work. But I think in the book of Acts, it's on steroids because God is doing something big here. To, to, and I always heard Acts was the book to read if you want to know about, your, if you want to understand the church and everything. It's a good one. Yeah. Yep. All of the epistles would be, you know, would be good ones too for because they are written to specific churches going through specific problems. And he tells, speaks to them how to address it. You know, like Corinthians, for instance, and their, their communion issues and how messed up their communion. Well, Paul orders it for them. So that's, those are helpful, mm -hmm. helpful kinds of things. Well, well, so it's God's church. This is, this is my, I think that, that unquestionably we have seen, especially in what the so-called non-generation is a, an apostasy from the church in what's called often called Gen Z. And that it is that there are, are a lot of a lot of young people that just are not there anymore. And it's really easy to become, to worry about the future of the church. And, and we do that because we don't trust perfectly and because we're sinners and because we love people that, that we know have walked away from the promises of God and we wish they'd come back and we because we know it's important. Acts helps me to, helps me to, if there's one thing that I am by nature, it's a pessimist. And that's a, that's a bad thing. That's a sinful thing. And it is one thing that, that Acts helps us to see is that there's one thing a Christian can't be, is a pessimist. That whenever we know who's won the victory already and, and how the, the final score is going to be going to play out, we know Jesus is in his heaven and he's got it all in, in his control. Then really... Pessimism is a, you know, that's a faithlessness on my part. And that's something to always say, oh, God, help me to, you know, help me to know it's still your church. You're still, your word still has power, that you'll still build your kingdom wherever your words proclaim. And, and he's done it in the past and he can do it in our generation also. Well, we'll close. 
Heavenly Father, you you sent out your your twelve and and Saul among them and Barnabas to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And through their their teaching, you brought many to know salvation. We pray that in our day you would continue to to let your the voice of your gospel go forth and that you would cause it to bear fruit, that you would help us in all of our circumstances, in our families, in our in our workplace, in our friendships, our associations, wherever we are to, to speak the name of Jesus. And we pray that, that you would, would let those seeds that are planted bear fruit in your good and perfect time. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll, I think we'll be here. There's no reason we wouldn't be here. So I'll see you next Tuesday, if you can hear this. <laughs>